collaboration with the Cyprus Mail. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. Coming up on the programme this week, Tuesday was United Nations Day. The UN's charter begins in the name of We the Peoples of the United Nations. It reaffirms the dignity and worth of every human being, respect for human rights and the equal rights of men and women, and a commitment to social and economic progress. Diwali, the Hindu festival, celebrated in Cyprus last weekend. It's all about love and compassion and acceptance and integrating and bringing more people together. Telehealth can cut unnecessary hospital visits. You commit to say we want to reduce hospitalizations or we want to reduce the number of visits to emergency departments and you design programs in order to get those outcomes. The Cyprus Investment Promotion Agency lays out its plans for encouraging the film industry to the island. We've introduced a package of incentives for the filming industry, which we hope will attract producers from abroad and potentially also from Cyprus to do more productions in Cyprus. And back to the topic of health, an ageing population means there are more and more people with what's known as multi-morbidity. And experts say care teams must work together for the best results. Almost in all countries, the people with multimorbidity are quite similar, their problems are quite similar, their needs are quite similar. Tuesday was United Nations Day, and a reception was held at the Lidra Palace in the buffer zone in Nicosia. The UN Secretary-General's Special Representative in Cyprus and also Head of the United Nations Peacekeeping Force on the island, Elizabeth Speha, had this to say. One of the Secretary-General's key points in his message of today is that, and I quote, we have to transcend our differences to transform our future. Unquote. I think we can all reflect on this message, which resonates deeply in this region, including Cyprus. In the aftermath of Montana, the Secretary General has called on the parties to the Cyprus problem to reflect on the outcome of the recent talks and on the possible way ahead. He has reiterated the UN's readiness to assist the sides should they jointly decide to engage in such a process with the necessary political will. We know that since the closure of the conference on Cyprus a few months ago, many of you are still coming to terms with dashed hopes and uncertainty about the future. But we shouldn't be discouraged. The people of this island can achieve unity and a better future if they invest in building a constituency for peace. Peace is indeed built from the ground up and the leaders need broad and consistent support from across civil society to bring the peace process to a successful conclusion. In this regard, I'm encouraged by the efforts of so many on this island who are reaching across the divide, seeking to understand the other's perspective, bridging differences, and proving that what brings the communities of Cyprus together vastly exceeds what separates them. Cyprus is in the midst of a turbulent region, and in many respects, as the Secretary General has said, we're living in a turbulent world. The most difficult challenges that we're facing transcend oceans and borders, and therefore demand effective global responses. It reminds us that the UN's role remains paramount, and we must be up to the task. This is one reason why, from the earliest days of his tenure, Secretary General Guterres has focused on de developing a series of ambitious reforms for the organization. On peace and security, he's rethinking the way the UN addresses crises, proposing ways for the system to work more coherently and effectively as a whole. Peace operations on the ground are also being reviewed to ensure their efficiency and effectiveness, including emphasis. But perhaps Secretary General, uh, General Guterres' boldest reform is the gender parity strategy. 
The UN must lead by example. And from entry positions to the highest level of responsibility, women must be fully and equally represented in the organization. As part of a strategy, the Secretary General has made a commitment to reach parity among senior leaders by 2021, and ultimately across the UN system in 2028. I'm pleased to say that the UN in Cyprus has made no notable strides towards gender parity, whether in unfacit, the good offices, or the wider country team. Our former force commander was a formidable General Kristen Lund, and I'm pleased to announce that Norway will send us very soon a no less formidable female senior police advisor, Anne Kristen Kvillekval, to head the UN police component in Anfasir. As we celebrate UN Day, please allow me to recall the various contributions of the UN in Cyprus and to pay tribute to my colleagues. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the role of our peacekeepers, military, police, and civilian, who patrol the buffer zone, keep the peace, bridge differences, build confidence, and work to foster greater understanding between the communities. I would particularly like to thank Anfasit Troop and police contributing countries. 36 nations have contributed since 1964, either troops or police or both to the mission. And I also pay special tribute to the 186 personnel who have lost their lives in the service of peace on the island. I must underscore the important work of the Secretary General's good offices, where I also serve as Deputy Special Advisor. Our former Special Advisor, Espen Barth Eide, and the entire good offices team worked tirelessly over the past few years in support of the negotiations. We continue to be at the ready to facilitate a viable negotiation process and rely on the parties to decide on that path. UNHCR is playing a vital role in working with the authorities in their responses to the difficult plight of migrants and refugees who are arriving on Cypriot shores. And UNDP continues to work across the divide to foster results-oriented bi-communal projects including the key conservation works implemented alongside the Technical Committee on Cultural Heritage and the European Union. I should also mention the key role of the UN third member of the Committee on Missing Persons, who contributes to the work of this essential institution. To all of you, my thanks for being such an integral and valuable part of the UN family in Cyprus. But my deepest thanks go to our many partners and friends from this island, the Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots, as well as Armenians, Latins, Maronites, and all others who make up the marvelous fabric of Cyprus. We appreciate the constructive interaction and mutual respect that have characterized our relations with you over the decades, and we do not take them for granted. Only on that basis can we play an effective role. We also strongly appreciate the good relations that we've developed throughout the years with the many vibrant representatives of the international community. Dear friends, colleagues, excellencies, today we celebrate the founding of the United Nations as an organization. The UN is not merely a collection of, of peacekeeping or political missions, agencies, or even governments. The UN's charter begins in the name of we, the peoples of the United Nations. It reaffirms the dignity and worth of every human being, respect for human rights and the equal rights of men and women, and a commitment to social and economic progress. We are all the people described in the Charter, and each have a role to play in lifting up our fellow human beings, especially at such a time of tumult and difficulty for the world. We ourselves have to work on transcending our differences to transform our future. On United Nations Day, let all of us make this vision a reality. Thank you and happy United Nations Day. The head of the United Nations Peacekeeping Force in Cyprus and also the UN Secretary General's Special Representative, Elizabeth Speha, speaking at the reception held on Tuesday to mark United Nations Day.
You can subscribe to the Cypress News Digest on iTunes for free and get the program downloaded to your phone or tablet so you can listen anytime, anywhere. Vandana Gol is the managing director of the Zenning Resort in Lachi, and they recently celebrated Diwali, which is the biggest festival in the Hindu calendar. So you celebrated it here in Cyprus. What's it all about? Diwali is, it's like uh, Christmas is for Christians and um, it uh, comes in the month of October or November because it follows the lunar calendar. It's not the same date every year, but it, it's a no moon day in the Hindu calendar. And uh, it's a religious festival, but it's more social than religious. And being in Cyprus, I've celebrated it with my Cypriot friends and my English friends and all my non-Indian friends for many, many years. And they've been part of it. And um, it was celebrated in Zenin for the first time, but I've celebrated it at my home for about 20 years now. And my friends start asking me in August to mark their calendar to tell them exactly when Diwali is this year so that no, to mark it, not to miss it. So Diwali is the festival of lights. It signifies triumph of light over darkness. And uh, the story behind it is the good King Rama was exiled to the forest by his stepmother and he slayed the demons and all the bad people. And he came back and this is how his kingdom welcomed him. They lit lights in the kingdom to welcome him back after 14 years. So... That is the story, but uh, it's much more than that. It is about triumph of good over evil, of light over darkness, of love, of... uh, of, uh, So it celebrates all the positive things, basically. It, It does. I mean, like most religions, I mean... This is the message of Diwali. You you forget all your differences, you f- forget all the bad things in your life, and you come together and you celebrate, and you celebrate life, you celebrate light. And that is what I like about uh, Diwali here in Cyprus, because... Um, People know so little about it, but my little group of friends, they, they make such an effort to be part of it. I mean, over the years they've learned from me, so they, they make such an effort to dress right, to eat you know, what I offer them, and to do everything that is ritualistic that I would do back home. But they, they do it for me and with me, and uh, it's beautiful because it's very heartwarming for me that everybody makes such an effort. And uh, here at Zenning... Um, we try to do it with our bigger group of friends. We have the annual banquet this time of the year, every year. But this time it just happened to coincide with Diwali. So we just uh, gave it that theme and we just tried to celebrate uh, it with light this year. And I think people liked the idea. People were very happy to, to be part of uh, the celebration. And I think we've taught the meaning of Diwali to a wider audience this time. A lot of more people know about Diwali. It gets the message across. I wish people would understand and imbibe the spirit of Diwali much more because it's all about love and compassion and acceptance and integrating and bringing more people together. It's exactly antithesis of what is happening in the world right now, in the bigger world, and I think that is what it's all about. It's slaying all the bad things and helping all the positive things win over all the bad things in the world. And that can't be a bad message, can it? Diwali celebrated in Cyprus uh, last week, and that is Vandana Gul from the Zenning Resort in Lachi. Keep up to date with events in Cyprus and around the world with the Cyprus News Digest. Digital innovation to prevent and better manage non-communicable diseases was one of the topics at the conference I attended recently in Denmark. And one of the speakers is my next guest, Christina Beskos, is European Programme Manager, Philips Hospital to Home, or Telehealth. She joins us now. Christina, Telehealth, what does that mean? Telehealth is uh, the capacity to provide health uh, at a distance so that you don't need to have a a coincidental moment in time and in place between a physician, a nurse and a patient. So that allows that, that the patient can be at home 
and avoid visits and uncomfortable traveling and also a more regular contact to the healthcare system. Now you've been working on I think a three-year program called Act at Scale. What has that been doing? The Act at Scale is, is a cooperation from uh, industry, academia and healthcare regions in looking at the scaling up of telehealth and care coordination projects. So there are different programs in five regions in Europe. So this is uh, Catalonia, Basque Country, Northern Ireland, Northern Netherlands and South Denmark. And we look at, at uh, programs that have already reached uh, the clinical efficacy. So they have demonstrated they are good for the citizens and for the system and they are in the process of scaling becoming routine care so that there is not a, a, the exception for the patients and we are looking at this process of scaling up that is bringing new challenges because you need to involve the organization you need to change the model of care you need to redesign the reimbursement system and supporting that scaling up process and and really trying to promote that we know that most healthcare systems are underfunded and looking for ways to save money, but I think this is more than just a way of freeing up resources and saving money. What are the advantages of telehealth? I mean, telehealth and digital health, what it really brings is, is what we call this credible aim. So you, you, of course, try to optimize the resources, but also is to have a better experience of care for the user. So I think we have to now to take into account the quality of life and the quality of the people involved and also the, the staff, so the, the professional experience of health, because, I mean, at the moment we are reaching levels of workload that are not bearable and, and we really need to improve efficiency is on, on that side too. And fourth is really health of populations. I mean, with the increasing demands for chronic disease and, and the uh, aging of the population, we, we have more demand, but also more complex demands. So the, the way we were approaching healthcare we, in silos, in disciplines, it, it will not be sufficient to cover really the demands in 20 years. So we, this is really a change of the model of care in order really to think about health as a continuum so that the person should be managed or, or as a health person from the beginning to the end also and, and people spend most of the time at home or at work and they don't want to, to just when to talk about healthcare just think about hospitals or, or clinics. It's I suppose fairly in its infancy but the other thing is that right now some of the oldest people around who could benefit from this are not computer savvy. They're not into IT. But in five, ten years' time, I think it's fair to say that most people reaching retirement age now have a smartphone, know how to go online and will absorb this new technology without any difficulty. How will you ensure that that transition goes smoothly. I think you see the trends in both ways. I mean, one is, as you say, that the population is becoming more and more technology savvy, but it's also that the technology is becoming more and more easy to use. So uh, what in our test, we have a normally a target population of, of people between 70 and 80, and we have very easy uh, interfaces so with really big fonts, with a lot of icons, very intuitive. And normally, I mean, with a training of less than half an hour we don't have any any difficulties in our target population so what you see is people who are not used to technology probably they will need a bit more training but uh, it's just a matter of time as you say so I, I don't see really the big obstacle is is the technology at all it's really the redesign of the process on the professional side and on the reimbursement system what do you mean by that? That um, in many countries we are used to have a, a payment per service. So the more you, you, you actions you take, the more tests, the more uh, the, the the more incomes come into the system. And this is a very perverse model because it, it is really promoting uh, more and more unnecessary uh, actions. And what you you have to move to uh, models that go to outcome base or share benefits we so say what is what we all want as a system so whether it's a health provider or a technology provider as a system we should all get better outcomes and and that you commit to say we want to reduce hospitalizations or we want to reduce 
the number of visits to emergency departments, and you design programs in order to get those outcomes. And if you reach those, then the, the, the benefits should be shared among the providers. And also, if you don't reach, that there should be also the penalty should be shared among providers. And, and it's not just the opposite. So the less you use in the system, the better will be for everybody, also for the patients. I mean, you don't need to go so often to the clinic. So that will be also... And better for them. the difficulty always is measuring the success yep. of anything like this. How do you mm -hmm. do that? I mean, what we are doing in Act at Scale is, is having different levels of measurements and, and we have uh, combining qualitative and quantitative methods, which means you, you can have surveys to the population, to an, uh, so patients, staff and, and managers, but you also need to quantify in terms of individual and population indicators. The problem you have is, is the time span that you have so what is what is your value and depending on the population so if you're looking for for example some mortality decrease or hospitalization decrease you need to have a time bandwidth maybe of two three years in order to really see an f significant effect if you want to look into quality of life you, you can go to much shorter times because people immediately recognize that so I think it's very important when, when we do this evaluation to understand exactly what is the value that we are measuring and what is the time span that we have in order to, to make an impact. But you sound pretty confident that this is the way to go and it will have an impact on yeah. everybody. I, I have no doubt about that, yeah. Christina Beskos, European Programme Manager for Philips Telehealth Population Health Management in Böblingen in Germany, also leading the ACT at Scale, that's Advancing Care Coordination and Telehealth Deployment at Scale. It's a programme that's co-funded by the European Union. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralembis. The Cyprus Investment Promotion Agency, as its name suggests, works tirelessly to bring new investment to Cyprus. Its Director General is Natasa Pilidou, and I spoke to her recently when they launched a new programme to attract audiovisual services to the island. She explains. We've introduced a package of incentives for the filming industry, which we hope will attract um, producers uh, from abroad and potentially also from Cyprus to do more productions in Cyprus. And that's not just for films, it's also for series, for documentaries, for various types of productions. It's something that the film industry here has been calling for for a very long time. Why has it taken so long to see the potential for this type of industry? Well, um, I can't answer for what went on in the past. Uh, I know that ever since I um, joined the um, uh, Cyprus Investment Promotion Agency, it has been high on the agenda. It has also been very high on uh, the government's agenda. And in fact, the reform unit initiated the effort with a plan for growth. I agree with you that it is something that could have happened sooner, but we're very happy that uh, the government has been so uh, proactive at this stage at, um, with its promotion. So what are you offering to people who want to come and make films in Cyprus? So we're offering uh, several incentives. One has to do with a cash rebate, which is basically a return of a proportion of one's spend if uh, that spend is above a certain level. And the percentage that they get is uh, determined by a test, a cultural test, which basically involves um, things like how much of the culture of Cyprus do they show? How much of European culture do they showcase? Uh, are there any historical events? Are there any worldwide events or important um, social aspects that are being um, showcased? Does it uh, embrace diversity, etc.? There are certain criteria. Um, then the second measure has to do with a tax credit. That is an alternative to the cash rebate, so one cannot select both. And the tax credit 
uh, would be selected by companies that aim to have a lot of profit, I suppose, so that they would then uh, use the tax credit against the taxable profit that they would have in the Cypriot company. And then there are other incentives to do with the investment into uh, infrastructure. If that infrastructure, if that equipment remains within the Republic of Cyprus for five years, then they are eligible for a deduction against their taxable income. And finally, uh, VAT, VAT on the amount spent is recoverable under certain conditions and up to a certain amount. How far have you taken the example of particularly Malta, I have in mind, but mm-hmm. I think Ireland's also very successful. Yes, we looked at a variety of similar incentive schemes, both in Europe and outside of Europe. Malta is a good example, which we have, uh, of course, referred to. We've also looked at Ireland and the UK as well. But um, our analysis, our sort of overall analysis includes a wide, uh, a large number of countries that we looked at initially and narrowed down to, uh, you know, what we thought were the best characteristics. And when do you expect the first take up of this? We don't know. There's definitely a lot of interest. So people are inquiring about it. So we hope it will be um, soon after the implementation of the, of the plan. And that's going to be? That's going to be, uh, we hope, on the 1st of January 2018. And so as soon as uh, production's finished shooting, they can make their application and it will be examined with some very good time frame so that there's no delays. The Director General of the Cyprus Investment Promotion Agency, or SIPA as it's known here, Natasa Pelidou. It's estimated that some 50 million people in Europe suffer from multiple chronic conditions. They need integrated care from multidisciplinary teams, and one of those is joining us now. She's worked on the I Care for EU project, and she is Anneli Huyala. Anneli, tell us about the project and what it aimed to do. Our project uh, aimed to identify different kind of of programs or initiatives which have addressed multimorbidity in Europe. That means people who've got a lot of chronic conditions. Yes, people who have at least two chronic diseases. And that means that the team looking after them has to be well informed about all the problems, doesn't it? Yes, and in our project, well, we looked for this kind of programs, and and most of the programs uh, used multi-professional teams to improve the care for people with multimorbidity. But there were, of course, uh, other kinds of uh, solutions like care managers or any kind of collaboration between between care professionals. Now, I think you were on the project trying to find best practices that could be shared with other health services so that this holistic approach to people who have several conditions can be implemented across Europe or indeed further afield? Yes, and uh, we found altogether about 100 programs in 24 European countries and of course they differed. Countries have uh, different kind of uh, healthcare systems and, and so on, but of course we could identify some potential or promising practices there, which which could be implemented also in other countries. Does it depend only on the healthcare system in each country, or does culture and attitudes to medical care also play a part? Well, of course, uh, culture means, but from my perspective, I am a researcher on integration and uh, collaboration. I think that, uh, that almost in all countries, the people with multimorbidity are quite similar, their problems are quite similar, their needs are quite similar, and also care professionals like doctors and nurses and, and so on, despite of what kind of system there is, they are also quite similar. So from, from my perspective, it's always a question of collaboration between people, and that is something that the we can learn from each other. What are the main problems for the patients if that collaboration is not there? Well, the patient has to find his or her way in the jungle of services so that uh, he is sent from one professional to another professional and every time he has uh, to tell his uh, 
problems again and again and and it's of course it is frustrating and people get tired and people get uh, fed up with with the system but in particular tired yes and so what was the conclusions of the project what needs to be done and how easy is it to do and indeed how costly is it to do yes of course there are many ways ways to tackle this problem but patient centeredness is the first we have to ask the patient what are his or her real needs and and we shouldn't as care professionals we shouldn't just give orders to people but also it is very in addition to patient centeredness it is very important to integrate our systems so that that the care professionals collaborate with each other so that they can share the information they have of patient which means of course that we should have better healthcare records as we have at the moment and we should use e health of course and actually i wouldn't say i may be a bit idealistic but i wouldn't say it would cost more but i think we could save costs because we could also by collaboration decrease costs by avoiding for example unnecessary hospital visits perhaps and overlapping care and overlapping tests and things like that so there is wastage in the system that a yes. collaborative approach can cut out yes yes coordination of care collaboration of professionals and uh, involving the patient in his or her care that is Anneli Hujala who has a PhD in health management science and works as a senior researcher in the department of health and social management at the university of eastern finland telling us about the i care for eu project Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.